especially want to reach out and thank her committee um, for getting her here as well. So uh, online we have Dr. Eloise Elliott, uh, Dr. Susanna Dillon from Texas Women's University. Um, who else is online? Uh, Dr. Uh, Melissa Scherfinski, who's here at WVU. Uh, Dr. Bolger couldn't be here today, unfortunately, so I also want to thank Dr. Wyant for stepping in as an approved substitute uh, for Dr. Bolger so that we could get uh, Chloe's defense running today. So thank you very much for doing that at the last minute. Much appreciated. I also want to thank the Dean for coming. I understand this is your first WVU dissertation defense. So I am delighted. Awesome. This will be a very appropriate first dissertation defense. It will be. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So with that welcome, I hate to do this, but I would like to ask everybody except for the committee and then faculty members can stay if you'd like as well if you're using this to get grad faculty status or anything. But I do need to ask everybody to step out while the committee just has a quick chat and a conversation. I'll call you back in. I have special education's Dear Colleague Letter, written in 2016. And this was written to address the disproportionate amount of students with disabilities with emotional and behavioral disorders, exclusion from public education. So what this letter said is educators need to be able to provide free and appropriate public education by providing positive behavioral intervention support. So what this letter showed is challenging behavior can serve as a barrier to inclusion. And so this is related to physical educators because they hold less favorable attitudes towards students with challenging behavior as compared to students with disabilities like physical disabilities. And these attitudes are informed by their previous experiences working with students with disabilities with quality throughout these three phases. So I first identified within the phases and then I looked at how it changed to ultimately understand how individuals develop, develop uh, self-advocacy toward behavior management of students with disabilities. So to address these research questions, let's talk a little bit about my method. I used a two-part concurrent mixed method. The first part was quantitative. 85 participants filled out a survey. The first part of the survey collected information on demographics. So this included um, things like their gender, their years of experience, represented organizational. So within this first theme, out of sight, out of mind, acculturation, again, represented that childhood period until the point at which they entered their physical education, teacher education program. My interview participants overwhelmingly reported that they had limited experiences with individuals with disabilities during their childhood, and if they did, that was with neighborhood friends or extended family members. Within their education setting, the participants seemed to be fairly unaware of their peers with disabilities, and this was reported as their peers being in self-contained classrooms, as you can see in that first um, yellow quote. In this blue quote, you can see that some of the participants saw the self-contained classroom as a form of behavior management, and that if students with disabilities were not behaving within that pub public education setting, the self-contained self, the self -contained room was used as management to send them back to. So also within this theme, um, the interview participants focused on how their parents, teachers, and coaches uh, influenced them. They had a large influence. So you can see in that first yellow quote, parents had large influence in that they taught their students inclusion and um, not judging a book by its cover and the golden rule. You can also see in the second yellow quote how the participants really valued the compassion they received from their teachers and coaches, which was a driving factor that they themselves sought a career as a physical educator. It's absent of individuals with disabilities and their future role teaching them. So this on-the-job learning through collaboration, experiential learning, and professional development also showed to be a significant influence on their self-efficacy. Something that did not show to be effective at informing their self-efficacy was their AP preparation in their PEAK programs. So why my findings are important is it suggests as a field, it may be more advantageous to shift our focus from solely on improving PEAK programs to enhancing our continuing professional development. And so as we learn that value for stakeholders and colleagues should be taken advantage of in structured continuing professional development opportunities. So this would look like um, colleagues, uh, like AP teachers, special educators, and those stakeholders working together with you know, professional development. Also, by taking advantage of early career physical educators and later career physical educators working together in these um, professional development experiences, it may limit the amount of washout uh, from the pressure of those later physical educators on the early physical educators. And it might also um, enhance the innovative and novice strategies the early, early physical educators would have learned in their PEAT programs so there can be an exchange of expertise. 
So it would be important that we conduct a longitudinal inquiry into the influence of these professional development trainings on physical educators' self-advocacy toward behavior management over time. All right, everybody, thank you for being here. Are there any questions? So at this time, I'm going to open up um, questions from the committee first. Um, so if you uh, something, if you want to unmute yourself, whoever wants to go first, ask a question. Or maybe you can help me better understand that. Yeah, or I'm happy to. Is that really true that the quantitative data is dominant? It is true, and this is something I kind of like reckoned with. But ultimately, with <clears> the mixed <throat> method studies, the um, method that is most dominant is the one that the is used to um, is the outcome is explained by the um, the other source of um, method. And so what that for my study meant is that the qualitative data was used then to explain the quantitative data. And so quantitative then is considered the dominant. And it may be the case that they're both it's both a quant both dominant quant and qual, but I'm pretty sure I think that was because, um, so Bandura suggests on self-efficacy scales that to try to broadly um, measure a task or something that individuals feel they're capable of, it's hard to measure things um, broadly instead of focusing on those individual. Um, so if you focus on more of a broader construct that you're trying to measure, it's not gonna be necessarily representative of that smaller construct. So I wasn't able to find a scale that I felt um, was appropriate for my study, and that's why I chose this scale. Scale, but it may not have captured the unique features of uh, physical educators within the unique setting of teaching physical education or that behavior management, because uh, uh, that scale was validated with classroom teachers. Yeah, could you maybe extend? So my thought too is like they scored so highly on the scale, but yet in the in the interviews, you're kind of seeing conflicting. Right. That they really don't have high right. rates of self efficacy. So, what might you hypothesize the find that would be seeing that? Is that just because of an issue with the scale not being specific enough? Yeah, I think that the scale didn't necessarily capture the unique setting in which they teach in. And I think for that reason, they probably, as physical educators, may feel more adaptable and able. How did you tease out when you were talking to participants? thinking about students with disabilities rather than just the class as a whole. Yeah, as a whole. that is such a good question because in the pilot of my interview, what I found was that I really needed to continue to reinforce and remind us students with disabilities that that was our focus. And in the first two interviews, I learned that I needed to hold the reins a little tighter because physical educators, the nine, they oftentimes would just go on and speak about what they wanted and the difficult things. And there was this overwhelming of like, it's not only the students with it's with all the students, and I'd be like, okay, you know, my focus is and trying to redirect, redirect. But is there anything else like you could just, you know, shed light on? How much of a factor was that for your participants? It was like almost a factor in that I almost made a theme of it. Like it was so representative of like all nine, and coming back to the differences they saw. Um, one of the physical educators, I just have like my brain to be honest, um, talked about how. Um, one of them was really focused on the highlights of that experience and being able to learn from the parents, whereas others really focused on how the behavior was just out of control and how there were really things that they that they felt prepared. Um, things like internalizing and isolation were some of the role of leadership and yes. administration. Oh yeah. Um, so a lot of the adaptive PE teachers talked about how administrators between the classes that they um, were between the schools they worked at were different and how that influenced behavior management. And then some of the later and mid-career participants spoke about how they experienced changes in that, um, the support from the administrators and they tied that to professional development and that they might have had limited experiences in some schools and then found at another school they have really had like these robust opportunities. And so it was very dependent on both district and administrators. Another early career participant told me that he switched from general physical education to be an adaptive physical educator. So he was so upset um, by the administrators countering what he believed. And one of the direct quotes that I love was, he said, I sent a student to the office and then came back with a candy bar. Yeah. Yeah. And then my last question. Okay. So one comment is, uh, Chloe, I think we're more closely academically related than you talked about before. 
Dan Lordy's work, which is one of the seminal works on a school teacher. He also wrote work on the school principal, which is also a seminal work. He studied with, uh, taught with my dissertation chair. Oh, really? So that whole University of Chicago looking at things kind of affects how I've thought about my career and my work. Yeah. I'm particularly interested in this idea of the apprenticeness, apprenticeship of observation. Sure. Because everybody who went to school thinks they could be a teacher, and everybody who's been a teacher thinks they could be a principal, mm -hmm. and everybody's PE because their behavior is considered aggressive, um, and that you know probably would be due uh, within the urban setting that I would conduct those studies. However, I haven't really thought about the greater. I think when you're at an affluent school that looks like a university compared to a I think that's a really good plan. Yeah, I, I noticed that as well. Um, Intuitively, to me, it makes sense that you're going to have folks. So, um, kind of like you said, respond. Your AP teachers might be more responsive in part because this is this is something that they're connected to. And the GPE teachers who did um, respond were like, oh, this is such an important topic. I'm so frustrated with my school. And 